Hey everybody, how are you doing? This is Ian O'Byrne again. Uh, this is basically the video, uh, my week note. Uh, today I'm recording this on Saturday, October 21st, 2017. I'm going to use uh, issue number 120 of Too Long Didn't Read, uh, my weekly newsletter to basically guide through things that I've been working on throughout the week and different things that I've been thinking or things that I think I've been thinking. Um, so one of the first couple things that I have in here is I have a post about uh, online sincerity and truth in labeling. Um, this is in light of some of the recent discussions and thoughts I've had about critical evaluation of online information and media literacy and information literacy. Um, my dissertation focused on critical evaluation of online information. Uh, my dissertation is online. It's about 250-ish pages long. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is that um, you know, a lot of the times we put materials out there and we don't think about how, uh, you know, normal people, quote unquote, normal people would read and use these materials. So over the last couple months to a year, I've been trying to find ways to make my materials more accessible and approachable. Um, so more accessible, meaning that they can sort of get it and get their hands on it, but also accessible in terms of, you know, is it a is it their, um, does it get to their approach point? Uh, and that, that brings in the approachable side of things. Uh, as a classroom teacher and also as like a department head and stuff like that, I would think about, you know, how do I make my content or things that I want to teach uh, approachable or accessible for my students? Like how do I find the approach point for them so that they can understand and really get it? Um, and I don't think that we spend enough time thinking about that um, as we create content online, especially for those of us that are academics or researchers or quote unquote like scholars. Um, so once again, my dissertation's out there. I conducted the work. It's been, you know, six, seven years since I've conducted that work or longer. And what I've been doing is as, as I see these events unfold with like critical evaluation and media literacy and information literacy, I've been thinking about, well, that's stuff that I sort of researched and learned about a while ago. <laughs> you know, why isn't, why aren't we talking about this? And then the better, the thing that I have to remind myself is, you know, why am I not talking about this? Um, so I've been going back to, you know, my dissertation and some of my old research pieces and finding one piece, you know, so out of the 250-ish page document, I go in and I find, you know, let's, let's find a sentence or two that's really meaningful. Um, and so this is, you know, what I've slowly been doing in my blog post. So this, this post is about online sincerity. It's a piece that, um, you know, a sentence or two in our, an idea in, in a much larger document that I think helps us think through these events. And so I, I pulled it out and I wrote a blog post about it and shared it. Um, but at the same time, I'm still trying to figure out ways to make it more approachable, more accessible. Uh, I was talking with a colleague this past week about, you know, what are opportunities that I have to take something like that blog post and instead of writing a four or five, uh, you know, a blog post that's going to take somebody four or five minutes to read, what are ways that I can possibly make, you know, a, a YouTube video about it and talk about it? Or what are ways that I can make a, a, a 10 second Instagram video? So I'm, I'm trying to find ways to create good content and, and concise content that is really directed to the audiences, which is for me, like the normal people out there that most likely won't read or don't care about this stuff. Um, you know, I think about some family and friends that I see them dealing with things. And I see their kids dealing with things and I'm like, you know what, this is something that you should know about. And this is something you should read. Um, and this is something you should understand. Um, but a lot of times we don't make it uh, present it in a way that's palatable for most people. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. How do we make it a little bit easier to consume a lot of this content? Um, I have a video out there also about how you should and could read online, and that leads to one of the other links that I have in, in this week's newsletter, so I'll just proceed on. Um, really good video uh, from a, a commencement address by Jim Carrey in the past. Um, it just It's one of those like sketch notebook pieces that we've seen a lot through like the, the Ted channels and stuff like that. Um, but it really makes you think about, you know, why are you here? What are you looking for? Like, 
you know, there's not, there's a need to really work for yourself and guide yourself in your thinking and learning. Um, proceeding on, uh, I shared a, a link to get involved in this survey. Um, pre, you know, came out, I'd say like two months ago. Um, but it's basically the Pew Information, uh, Pew Research Center and Elon put out a study where they're looking for experts in, you know, technology and, and future and thinking about trust and truth and misinformation online. And they're basically trying to figure out what's going to happen, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen with this, um, you know, th the current state of affairs as we th see things progressing. Um, and so there, there was a, a whole series of, of questions that they asked in the survey. And if I remember correct, there was like five or six areas and then they were a, a bunch of questions nested within the areas. And we saw some of these results come out uh, about a month ago, and I'm sure I reported in TLDR. And then this week, they released a, another set looking at, okay, what's the real future of, tr of truth and misinformation online? It was really interesting because it's basically talking about, you know, even the, the experts were uh, torn as to which direction things would head. Um, and so thinking through this, uh, you know, I have my quote in here, uh, you know, the one that I, I sent in for one of the questions or one of the items. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what this all means. Um, you know, it, it one of the things that we're seeing is that people aren't really willing to argue or discuss facts. Um, and truth is always uh, in the eye of the beholder. Truth is something that it is uh, in many ways situated. It depends on the, the individual or the person. Because my truth and, and things that I trust might be different than your truth and things that you trust. And that to me is absolutely appropriate. Um, but the challenge is that there's certain things that I think are facts. Um, you know, and, and we're, we're seeing people that are arguing or just totally um, mistrusting or uh, not agreeing with certain facts. Um, and, and so it's not really true that facts are facts because we see a lot of people online that are just choosing to look at different facts and, and have a different worldview and a different, you know, basis in reality. Um, and that can be problematic. But one of the things I think we're seeing is that it's hard to you know, we're seeing a lot of people that think about and argue about emotions and their worldview and their perspective and the facts go out the window. And so if you have someone that's emotion emotionally arguing, um, you know, or they're arguing from a pain point or their own human perspective or an, one event that they've witnessed and you come in and you try to argue with them based upon facts, you get nowhere because they don't really care. Um, and so my quote was basically, um, human nature will take over as the salacious is often sexier than the facts. So there's a lot of people that, yeah, we can argue facts and say, well, you're wrong because my facts state or these facts state. And most people don't care. If they're upset, they're upset. If they're arguing from a pain point or an emotional standpoint, they're going to, you know, that's the, the, that's the perspective that they're going to use. And the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, we're, we're arguing facts, but then there's a lot of salacious material that is out there. And human beings are human beings. They are going to most times, uh, you know, choose that path where they, they would rather think and talk about the salacious. Um, one, other, one other quick note, um, and this is one of the things I usually save the what am I thinking about or wondering about um, for later. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is... Um, you know, I, I saw recent video footage and photos from the Hubble telescope and, and I was just amazed and thinking about how vast the universe is. And, you know, and I, I, I watched Star Trek. I'm watching the new Star Trek series with my son and really enjoying it. And so and there's part of me that that really does think that there's other life out there, you know, or I'd like to really think of a future where we have space travel and that things like Star Wars and Star Trek can exist and and that we go meet these other civilizations. And I'd, and I'd like to believe that. And I'd like to believe that there's, you know, UFOs that have already landed here. And, and it might be total hogwash, but part of me likes to believe that. Um, you know, and I know that there's a lot of people that, 
um, you know, have mindsets and have beliefs. And they have things that may be totally wacky. You know, we might believe in, uh, you know, we look at things like Game of Thrones and we really want to believe in this fantasy um, that these things exist. And so there's a lot of people that have like a worldview or an interest or a belief, you know, or a mindset. Um, and so as I look at a lot of individuals and groups that subscribe to these, you know, alternative facts or whatever you want to call them or these this misinformation are they subscribing to a different worldview or a different mindset i i don't know you know where does one begin and one end um in in thinking through this and just talking through it with with a colleague of mine um he said well you know the 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 difference is when your worldview or your mindset basically infringes on my opportunity you know, to have happiness or peace or welfare, or, or, you know, if you're, if your mindset is basically harming me or potentially harming me or, or kicking me out of a country, then there is a difference. So something to think about, um, digging in a little bit more. And this is, you know, this is one of the pieces that sometimes in TLDR I try not to have too much about like the the misinformation, the elections, the political stuff here in the U.S. and 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 I I think there's reverberations for the U.S. and globally in terms of what's happening. I try not to have too much for like the the Russian hacking stuff and all that other news. Um, even though I'm reading a lot about it, and I have three or four pieces that I've ignored this week. Um, but one of the things that's that's increasingly clear is that. You know, a lot of us are um, brainwashed to a certain extent by our social media feeds, by these algorithms, and, and we learn from them. And, and, and the content that we learn may or may not be good for us. Um, and so it, 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 there's a need to sit down and really think about what role these networks and platforms and these tools play in our lives. And, and I was not going to include this link in TLDR this week. But then I was sitting there yesterday talking to uh, the the my the, the woman that runs my office, and we we're talking about um, you know some of these perspectives and and news information and um, and some of the the events of the week, just just talking and catching up, and you know we we're talking about the role of social social media, and she said, you know, I'm I'm thinking about just taking a break, you know, I'm thinking about taking a break, and I'm thinking about pulling back. Um, because I just don't feel like I get anything from it now. And I said, and, and I explained, you know, there's a lot of stuff that Facebook has done in the past. There's a lot of times they've played fast and loose with your data and your identity, and we don't really know what they're doing. And we see the, the Facebook mood survey or their, their mood experiment from two, three years ago. Um, and so we really have to ask ourselves, like, why are we there? You know, why are we really there? Why are we so invested? Um, Doug Belshaw had a link in, in his, um, you know, thought shrap in a live feed that I was just looking at um, that, you know, we're, we have people that are in social networks. Like if if we look at the amount of people in Facebook globally, we're we're finding these large, massive groups that are at the same level of some religious groups. And so we're looking at massive amounts of people that are all in just to be in. And so we got to ask ourselves, like, why are we there and what are we doing? And what are our expectations of these platforms? Um, because they're, they're not taking our best interest at heart. Um, and so I, I've thought in the past about, about leaving Facebook and leaving some of these other spaces. Um, I have not yet. Um, I, for the most part, just share stuff out. But I'm wondering... You know what else it, it means out there. So moving on, at you know after we think about social media and we think about what these tools might uh, do to us, um, one of the other interesting pieces that came across my feed this week, um, and this ties into a lot of other work that I'm working on right now. Um, I have a piece that I co-wrote with a bunch of colleagues that's coming out in pediatrics, and it talks about screen time and and adolescents and and little tiny tykes. And this report came out from Common Sense Media where they looked at screen use by children eight and under. Um, and so, I mean, that's the two tiny tots that I have in my house. I shared out materials 
uh, a couple weeks ago from a talk I did on parenting and screen time. So this is a real, it seems like this is a real hot button topic uh, for a lot of people. Um, and so this is a, a post from NPR Ed, and then it basically just talks about the report from Common Sense. Um, some of the interesting uh, tidbits from this, and, and when a lot of this research comes out, it's helpful for me to sort of save this in the back of my head, um, because this is stuff that I often will um, write into grant applications or publications, um, and a lot of this data is definitely going to go into a piece I'm working on with a colleague now. We're trying to decide if this thing turns into uh, a post that goes into the conversation or elsewhere. Do we send it out to People Magazine or does it become a book? So we're in this very, you know, fluid thought process about what this data becomes. But I mean, think about this data that we have here. So it's it's talking to parents uh, of children that are age eight and under, and they're saying that. 98% of homes have a mobile device such as a tablet or smartphone. Not really that surprising, okay? I do have questions about how much um, income and and status and as, and socioeconomic status plays into this, but you know, and how much is the the you know the participants that they're surveying, but we can ignore that for now. Um, but think about this, the the average time spent on devices by these children it went up to 48 minutes per day in the latest survey. And it was very, very low when they first started doing um, the survey a couple of years ago. But I mean, think about that. We're looking at pretty much like an hour a day that they're on devices. Um, and we have to think about, you know, it would be interesting to parse that out and think about in school, out of school, but we'll leave it alone for right now. 42% um, of young children have their very own tablet up from 7% four years ago and less than 1% in 2011. Screen use, screen media use, or screen use, among infants under two appears to be trending downward. So it's really interesting. Kids that age aren't really on, on you know, using a lot of media. And they talk about DVDs and stuff like that. 49% um, of kids eight or under often or sometimes use screens in the hour before bedtime, which is bad for screen habits. And then another thing that's bad for language development is 42% of parents say there's a lot of like just leaving the TV on in the background and creating that background noise and that hum. Um, so it's something to think about our use of screens and devices by tiny tykes. Um, and it's interesting to uh, compare that to the, the story we had before about Silicon Valley not being your friend, um, you know, and then about trust and misinformation. And then the story after um, looking at Students are learning better from books than screens. So this is, is research that um, Patty Alexander and Lauren Singer uh, shared, and it was looking at screen use by individuals. And for the most part, it was saying that, you know, students preferred reading printed text, you know, text on paper or textbook or magazine, as opposed to reading it on a screen. And the video that I have at the top of this basically says, uh, on one level, yeah, I definitely agree. I see that in my classes now, but I think that we're conflating a couple different issues. One, I can take a, you know, a, a textbook for a class at any grade level, and I can put a version of that textbook on a on a screen. So I can get a PDF or do an e-reader, put it on a tablet screen or a lap books, a laptop screen, um, and that would be, I guess, reading off of a screen. That. Yeah, I mean, with that, if I was a student, I'd much rather have the printed text. Um, the only affordability or the, the the only difference that you have from moving it to the screen is that it's easier to lug it around, and you can have a lot more books on it. Um, but I think what they're they're missing in this, and this is what I say in the video, what I think we're missing from this all is that we we ignore online reading and online reading comprehension and all the skills involved in that. So that's searching and sifting and critically evaluating and multiple sources and multiple modes of information. And that's not just text on a screen. That's multiple text across, you know, multiple forms of information and a lot of different strategies. That's a totally diff different universe. And that's something our students definitely need. And it's also stuff that we're already doing to, s to varying levels of success. Also, I think that we're we're a little bit short-sighted and we're not thinking about what reading on screens. So that's what reading on screens, you know, should be, the online reading. But we're not thinking about what reading on screens, you know, could be. 
So what are the affordances of the tool? Like, how can we really turbocharge our reading on different screens? Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if I'm just going to take a PDF and put it on a laptop screen and say, okay, read it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost like me saying, okay, here's my slide. Here's, you know, my newsletter. If it's up on your screen now. <laughs> take a look. Let your eyeballs glaze over it. What do you really gain from it? The answer is nothing. But if we start thinking about the use of tools like Hypothesis, where I can mark up and annotate content. If we um, take this and it's on a screen, so now I can just copy paste this and and send this out to someplace else. Or I can take this and open up a new window and say, oh, you, this is also on Facebook. Let me go see what Facebook has to say about this. So once we add that layer, then we can do some interesting things. The problem is we learned how to read back in pre-KK one, two, three. Um, so we learned how to read and now we read to learn and we learned how to read in in a in a somewhat narrow um, framework and so it was basically here's a book or here's a piece of text here's paper let's read on the text we all know where we are um, until we really start to push on one end push what we think reading on a screen could and should be and at the same time until we start to make that happen in early childhood elementary we're not really going to see differences in this, okay? Um, but my thinking is that we need to start pushing those boundaries and think about what we could do differently. Uh, great piece in here to, to wrap up this first section on reading about writing tips. Um, from I, I definitely recommend watching this video, the TED Talk on 12 Truths I Learned from Life and Writing. Um, but some really good advice on writing and thinking about your writing. It's been helpful for me as I blog and write, um, you know, especially like set your sights small. Think about small projects as opposed to doing a million different things at once. Um, I found it as I'm sort of rebooting my YouTube channel, you know, the need to think about let's just get videos online and then I can slowly work in more elements and more nuance to it. Um, I also like the idea about no shame in hitting the delete button. Uh, Hemingway's philosophy of like your first draft will stink and that's okay. Or your first draft is always going to be crap. Um, thinking about critics that you love, like people that can give you critique um, out of love and respect and, and improve your stuff. Um, I'm also really liking the idea of if all else fails, send Steve-O Lamont a letter. And basically this was saying like, if you get stuck in your writing, um, imagine that you're writing your ideas in an email or you're, you're writing your ideas in a uh, letter to someone that you know. So you're talking to someone specifically. And this has helped me in my blog posts. It's helped me in my videos. I imagine in, in creating my content that I have this avatar, this prototypical like consumer of my content. Um, and it helps me think about, okay, what would this person want to hear? What would this person need to hear? So I'm either writing or talking to, even in a video like this, I'm talking to someone specific. I'm talking to, you know, my sister Molly um, or my colleague Joan or, you know, an amalgamation of a couple different people. What would they need to hear? Um, in terms of make, there was a, an extension. I love finding these little Google Doc and, and extensions for your, your tools to think about ways to extend your work. So I'm going to be checking out this checkmark extension. And what it does is you can preload in comments to this extension. And as, as you're reading through a Google Doc, you can click and it will put an overlay up on your screen to show you little codes for your, for your comments. You click on it. And then it'll add a comment to the Google Doc. So it's a real powerful way to quickly add comments and feedback to work. Because a lot of times I feel like um, if I'm giving feedback on like lesson plans or unit plans, um, I have some of the same feedback that I always say. And after two or three students or two or three groups, you feel like you're typing the same thing again and again. And, and in a way that's good because then I know what to talk about in class you know, as a formative assessment, what do I really need to talk about in class and, and, and make sure they understand or change in their work? Um, but with this, what's nice is that I can basically pull this information up um, and create an overlay for that assignment. So I can say, okay, here's something. I can highlight the text, click a click once or twice, 
and then add in comments and feedback much more quickly. Definitely going to be checking that out. Uh, a nice quote by Henry David Thoreau talking about the cost of things and that the real cost of things is what we're ultimately exchanging it for in the long run. Um, and with that, we're basically wrapping up issue number 120 of Too Long Didn't Read. So a couple different things. One, I hope that this is meaningful for you. Um, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to Too Long Didn't Read up on my website. Um, my main website is wiburn.com slash tldr. I moved a couple things around this week. I, uh, I've i been killing off my podcast. I had a podcast that I was I had a lot of good content, a lot of interviews, and I'm in the process of moving the interviews off of YouTube, cleaning up the audio, adding more stuff, adding production and post-production to this, and then uploading it to SoundCloud and elsewhere to create an audio podcast. And then as I'm reworking YouTube and my uh, use of YouTube, I'm like, why am I spending this much time? Um, and so I, I'm, I'm toying with ways to connect my WordPress website and my YouTube content and YouTube channels. And so I've been playing with ways to add this in in a way that looks good to me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm relatively happy with the look of this right now, um, but I'm interested to see what other ways I can continue to tweak it so that it fits in with everything else. Um, but by all means, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm following uh, the advice that's given to us in, in the writing piece, which is set my sm site small um, and try to get small achievable victories. Um, so with that being said, my name is Ian O'Byrne. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate it. Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, let me know if there's things that you want to uh, have me talk about or we can learn about. Um, and with that being said, I hope you have a great rest of the day um, and keep in touch. See you later.